But tonight, I am really proud to introduce our speaker tonight. He's Bruce Harris, who is a Minute Man National Park Ranger. And during the week, I had a chance to talk to him on the phone, make sure he was coming and how he got here and everything. He's so pleasant. And I know some of you have already met him. B. Brown's met him, and uh, Bob Sledger's met him, and uh, you're going to like him. And he's full of knowledge about African Americans and in their part in the Revolutionary War. And he's going to talk to you about Peter Salem, the story of Peter Salem, who was a freed slave and who became a Revolutionary War hero. And uh, you will follow his story from Miriam's Corner in Concord to Washington's Army at Saratoga. So it is my pleasure to present Bruce Harris. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are you all doing tonight? Just very good. Well, I hope you didn't expect me to do this as Peter Sale. So. <laughs> uh, but I am dressed as, as he would be, at least what we assume. Um, thinking a lot about this this week, how I was going to do this program. How I'm going to get out of these clothes. <laughs> talked a lot with Cecile, were we going to do it, and it's almost like it's a dramatization, were we going to do it first person, where are we, was I going to just stand up and talk to you, and I don't want to do this, blah, 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 because, you know, a lot of lecturers do that, and it gets boring, <laughs> it gets boring after a while, you can admit it. So I'm going to talk about history in the fully modern way, I'm going to become fully interactive, that's that term that everybody uses nowadays, being interactive. So I'm going to be fully interactive, and that means you all are going to have to participate in this. So we're going to go back and forth as we do this program. I am going to tell you the story of Peter Salem. We're going to talk about African Americans in colonial times, specifically in this area. I don't want to get into you know trying to speak for all African Americans of all time periods. But <laughs> we're going to talk specifically about the time of the revolution, uh, what was it like for African Americans, but we're going to get started on this interactive thing. So how we're going to do this is, everybody's got a thumb, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good, because I didn't want to exclude anybody. So, <laughs> um, when, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions just to get us going, just to get us started here. And, you know, if you agree, you, you all know the thumbs up. If you disagree, thumbs down. <laughs> See, we're already doing history. We've already gone back to Roman times. Here. So, now, if you don't know or don't have an opinion, we'll do this thumbs sideways. And, we're not, and that's, that's good. We want everybody to get involved in all of this. So, now you all are members of the historical society, so I'm not going to ask really simple questions like, did, were there blacks in the revolution? You're here, so you obviously know that that happened. Now, how many of you think that on the very first day of the revolution, the majority of African Americans in this area were free. Thumbs up, thumbs sideways, or thumbs down. How many think it's so? If, it, if you think they were free, that's thumbs up. If you don't know, thumbs sideways, or don't care, thumbs sideways. Uh, thumbs down if you disagree. All right, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs down, that's great. You're right, now we're looking at about 99% of the African Americans in or around the Massachusetts Bay Colony were in fact enslaved. One percent. We're also looking at a population of about one in every six people. They say during the course of the war, now I just read a new thing, this is the brand new information. So one in every six people was either an African American or a mulatto or an Indian. I'm not buying that in 1775. I think it's more like probably three to four percent in this area. It seems to be logical when you're really looking at the numbers. Now, if we really narrow our cause down to the specific towns of Lexington, Lincoln, and Concord, we really are looking at just, just about four percent. I mean, just really nudging up to that four percent margin of African Americans. And it is true, though, that 99 percent of those people were actually enslaved on or around the time of April 19th, when the revolution happens. Now, what was their, what was their lives like? We're going to do our thumb thing again. So, 
Was their life equivalent to slaves in the South? If you agree, yes. Don't know, disagree. So do you think their lives were equivalent to slaves in the South? In that time period. Good, you guys are good on this. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Their lives weren't. Um, what, what we have here is a very bizarre situation. There's a lot of hypocrisy going on. There's a lot of denial going on. And this is really coming from both races. We're talking about people who are clearly enslaved, but we're also talking about people who are referred to as servants. That slave was a dirty word. I can only find one person in this area who had the occupation of slave catcher. He lived in Lincoln, so he wasn't he didn't live in Bedford, and I feel bad if any of, you, if any of you live in Lincoln, I'm sorry. But <laughs> now, out of this whole area, I'm talking, I'm looking at a radius of about 30 miles. I can only find one person who had the clear occupation of slave catcher, Samuel Weatherby. That was the slave catcher. Now, I found that in, um, what is it, a rich harvest. So check that out. <laughs> and that's the, only, that's the only person I've ever seen in the area. And that's the only book I've ever seen that term referred to. They use the term servant. Why servant? Servant. Well, <coughs> slaves lived in the house, obviously, in that time period. Slaves uh, worked very close to the family. Slaves were with the family a long time. It's really kind of hard to, to really think of a lot of these people as slaves. But they clearly were property. But in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they were property that could own property in that time period. So that's a kind of strange thing. You could own property, but you are property. How many people are going to let their toaster go out and buy a new car? <laughs> Get a credit card, run up a bill. Um, that doesn't, that's a very, very difficult concept and a very difficult thing for a lot of people to understand. There's also something called half freedom. Who's heard of half freedom? We'll do our thumbs up, thumbs down again. If you've heard of half freedom, hand, thumbs up. If you haven't heard, thumbs up. Okay, I finally got you on that one. <laughs> half freedom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain it the best way I possibly can. I don't fully understand half freedom. It doesn't make sense to me, and it might not make sense to you, and I think we're just too far removed from it to understand what half freedom really was. Half freedom is very close to indentured servitude. Very, very close, but there is a major difference. You literally, half of your time, half of your life is owned by someone else. But it's not split up, it's not like, okay, I own you on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and the rest of the time it's yours. It's not split up like that. It, it's a bizarre concept. It seems to be, the closest thing that it seems to be, that I can equate in modern times, is to condo ownership. Condo ownership, great for the guy that owns the property, not really wonderful for the person who owns the condo, because the guy that owns the property, you take care of all the interior walls and everything. He takes care of the exterior walls and stuff, but he doesn't have any responsibility for the electricity, your plumbing, or anything like that. That's what half freedom sort of was. You were a slave, you had to work for someone else. But he didn't have to clothe you, he didn't have to put a roof over your head, he didn't have to put food in your belly, he didn't have to do any of that. Great for the master, not so good for the slave. There were many more people who were bound by half freedom, and half freedom seemed to be what you went back to. You might have been a slave, you might have earned some money on the side, your master allowed you to work. You might have even bought your own freedom. And times got hard again before the war. And we're talking in and around the area between 1750 uh, on up to right before the revolution. Now, during the French and Indian Wars, you wanted to get out of this half freedom thing. And that's when you st a lot of blacks in the area started to learn that if you could go off and fight, there's a chance that you could be free. And that was an important concept because why, why would an African American in the time period want to fight for a slave-holding nation? I mean, it's a, you know, why? You're British, everybody's British in this time period, slave-holding nation. You're gonna fight for this talk of liberty and freedom? Well, wait a minute, you guys are slaveholders. 
You gonna promise me freedom? Can't give it to me on paper because I can't read and probably you can't either, so that doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, why, why was it? It was because of those that came before them. Those that had fought in the French and Indian Wars. They had an opportunity. They were honored, a lot of them got their freedom, the very few that did fight. This was remembered at the time of the revolution, the time of unrest. And if we start the time of unrest, really in 1763, when the, when the French and Indian Wars end, there's all the talk of liberty. There's, and in fact, a lot of blacks are referred to as good liberty men. There's Caesar over there, he's good liberty man. He'll go work for you, don't worry about it. You can talk about whatever you want around him. He's good liberty man. And that meant that they were, the African Americans in this area were really buying into this concept. And we, we're, you guys are a historical society, so I'm, I'm going to take you on the advanced route. You know about the propaganda mill, you know what happened there, and that's what they were using in this area. In fact, they really it, it, were getting blacks involved in this from day one. The term slavery starts to get used in and around 1769. Slavery starts to get, even though most people are talking about, well, they're my, she's my servant, and they're not talking about individual slaves at this point. They're starting to use the concept of slavery to get the lower classes to start thinking about how life isn't at all that good here. How it could be better if we were on our own. How it would be much better if we governed ourselves. I mean, for God's sake, who wants to be a slave to the king? Don't you want your freedom? Don't you want your liberty? George Washington himself said, if we do not pick up arms and continue this fight, we will be reduced to the level of those that we call ourselves masters to. The concept was laid out. That was what was going on. So if you are a slave, or even a freeman, you're hearing this. This is an opportunity. This is why the African Americans choose to fight. Now when we're talking about Peter Salem, this is the world that he's living in. He's a slave, clearly. Framingham, Massachusetts. We don't know where he was born. He didn't know where he was born. There are people that say he was born up in Salem, and that's why his name is Salem. I'm not buying that. Belknap was his master, Jeremiah Belknap. Now, Evidently, he at one point in time was from, I think he was from Salem. I don't know if he was born there, but he was from Salem. I think when he bought Peter, Peter was a small boy. And as a small boy, he named him Salem Middlesex. There's a lot of confusion. <laughs> right? Salem Middlesex. You all got it. <laughs> See, when I do these talks down in Washington, D.C., I never get a laugh. <laughs> so, they don't get that. Salem Middlesex. Right, named him after the county. Remind him of their birthplace. You look at slave names. Slaves, there was, there was one really horrible habit of naming slaves after great kings. Caesar, Prince, you, you've all heard those names. You know, naming them these very lofty, lofty names. Uh, Salem Middlesex actually was a fairly decent, good name if you were a slave at that time. It didn't sort of give you airs or give you ideas. And that's what one of the re ma main reasons we believe Belknap named him that. And he gets to be about 10 years old. Now, we think that he was probably born somewhere around 1750, just about the time that Crispus Attucks escaped. <laughs> so, so he would not have known Crispus Attucks. I, I just recently read a manuscript that somebody was working on that talked about the alliance between Salem and Crispus Attucks, which I don't buy at all because they would have never known each other. Attucks was down in New Providence in the Virgin Islands for most of, most of Peter Salem's life. So I don't believe that they would have known either, uh, known each other at all, even though they both were from the same town. Probably nobody even really talked about Crispus Attucks. Um, and at six foot four, nobody was definitely going to chase after him. So, <laughs> so I um, just wanted to clear that up. If you all have read the same thing, that, that's a very recent thing that just came out that somebody's been, been writing about. So now Salem is growing up down at Framingham. At about 10 years old, he gets brought into the church. Now, African Americans are brought into the church uh, because primarily there's an act that is created to allow African Americans to attend church. As many of their masters start to feel a little uncomfortable about this whole slavery. You know, I've got these people, they're living in my house. Are they Christian? 
you know, especially the ones that are directly from Africa or descendants of those who are directly from Africa and maybe the first generation. There's a lot of uneasiness here. You can't have people, non-Christians, living under the roof. So they are brought in um, into the church and confirmed in under Christianity. And this is also a really good control device. Because if you get somebody hooked, and I'm not going to question religion, and I, please don't misunderstand me here. Um, <laughs> but if you get somebody hooked on the belief that, you know, this is the one true religion, it's very easy to control them. And that was a, also used as a control factor. Hey, you know what? Yes, you're a slave. Yes, your life is not equal to mine. But you're going to get your reward in heaven. Don't you know what the, the pastor says in church every, every Sunday? You're going to get your reward in heaven. And this was definitely a very, very innate and strong belief among African Americans in that time period. And dare I say, which led the seeds to a very strong Christian belief in African Americans today. We still have that, not for the same reasons, but we still have that, and that's where a lot of that started. It was those traditions started there. And then they led to our own traditions, our own religious traditions. Now, Peter starts going to church. He gets confirmed in the church, and at about 10 to maybe 12 years old, his name changes. Time to get confirmed. Pastor's not going to confirm him with some sale of Middlesex, the name of the town. <laughs> Can't do that. You need a good Christian name. Well, it was the Anglican Church, so Peter. <laughs> You're Episcopalians. I'm an Episcopalian too, so you, you all know about Peter and Paul. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at that point is where we see him in and around 1760, 1762 is the first time we start hearing his name called Peter Salem. A lot of people think Salem, Middlesex, Peter Salem are two different people. You don't ever hear about an adult life of Salem, Middlesex. You don't hear about any, any of him fighting anywhere else. They're one and the same person. Salem, Middlesex, Peter, Salem, Middlesex becomes Peter Salem. And from that point on, people really refer to him either as Peter or Salem. A lot of times people just refer to him as simply as Salem. Most of his life, people would refer to him just as Salem. Now, we don't know very much more about his young life. I can tell you that his confirmation date is August 20th, uh, 1760. That's, that's his confirmation date. That's all I really can tell you about his young life. His young life is probably the same as many African Americans in and around this part of New England. He would be probably jack of all trades and master in them. Handyman, house house person. The Belknaps were wealthy, but not wealthy enough that Peter, and Peter wasn't old enough for him to have been a valet. I don't see him, as, there's nothing that I've read that has said that he was a valet or worked in that kind of capacity. He was basically the kind of guy, you know, hey, we need some more wood, go cut that, go down here, get that, you know, fix that, that kind of thing, a handyman around the house. Probably as he got older, he probably didn't sleep in the house anymore, which was very common for African males, African-American males. Women usually did stay in the house, took care of the children, did that kind of thing, the typical nanny type of, of occupation. Um, but men, as they got older, well, you know, you've got this guy, he's old, he works, he's getting older, he's getting into about 16, 17, 18 years old. Those of you who have had children and have had male children, know what it's like to have a 16 or 17 or 18 year old man in the house. And so imagine now having one that's not technically a member of your family and getting older and starting to feel, grow into his manhood. This became a threat to a lot of people. And you saw this, there were a lot of people who would take slaves in, especially young slaves when they were children into their home. And the male slaves, you see a lot of buying and selling going on at around that age, at around that coming into manhood age. This was no different for the Belknap family. As Peter got older, Peter began to live outside of the house. He began to live in the barn or in the shed out back. And when that got a little bit difficult, it is known that Belknap does put, see, put Peter up for sale. Now this is getting closer toward the time of the revolution. Now we're into about 1770 or so. By 1775, Peter's about 25 years old, and he's living with Leonette Buckminster. Now, the Buckminsters owned a sawmill in Framingham, and he's been sold to the Buckminster family. 
it is our belief that Peter worked in sawmill, that he was simply a slave to work in the sawmill and work in that sawmill operation. But now, y'all know what's going on between 1770 and 1774. Lots and lots and lots of unrest is going on. We've got the Boston Massacre, which probably definitely was heard about in Framingham. 1773, we've got the Tea Party and the harbor gets closed. Now, how does that affect the western and, mid and middle parts of, of Massachusetts? The harbor's closed. You're on a sawmill. What do you do when you with, with the sawmill? You ship wood. <laughs> Where do you want to ship most of that wood to? Boston Harbor. You go in that, and that's going to be used in all with by all the shipwrights down at the harbor. Well, now if the harbor's closed, there are any ships being built? There are any ships going in and out of the harbor? Now there were ships that were still being built, but a major portion of that was the marketplace. And the marketplace wasn't open, and a lot of things were stopping. And this area, again, the people could begin to really worry about what was happening. So, Peter's working for a sawmill. His master owns the sawmill. His master's economy is being affected directly. So he is now becoming privy to a lot of information about, and hearing a lot about liberty. And hear a lot about the talk of this isn't right, we've got high taxes, farmers closed, what, what's going on, the economy's being affected. Did he have any decision making in any of this? No. No. He didn't have any decision making in this. Mm -hmm. But we believe he was smart enough to see the beginnings of an opportunity. October of 1774 is when they started forming minute companies in and around this area. Framingham was no different. Framingham was looking at the militia system. Peter would have not probably, we know, if you look at the militia records in Framingham, they did not allow blacks in their militia. That was King's Law anyway. There were towns that ignored it, certainly. Obviously, Lexington did, or Prince Esterbrook would not have been standing out there on the green. The, the actual law was that Negroes were not. Negroes, um, those who are infirm and those who are idiots are exempt from militia service, which was from 16 to 66 years of age. There are towns, obviously, that do ignore it. Framingham didn't seem to ignore it, but Framingham also had a lot of men who were at least upper middling class or just on the verge of being gentlemen. So they were basically starting to form minute companies. And as the minute companies began to form, Many of the young men in the town are being gathered up and saying, hey, look, we definitely want you in the minute company. Now Peter, being close to all of this action, is going to obviously step forward. And you can clearly see if it's happening, if the talk is all there, the talk of liberty, the talk of freedom, all this unjust treatment that's going on. And we've got to do something. We've got to change everything. Well, there's that opportunity. There's that, that word change. If things can change, and Peter's going to start to step forward, and he does, and he asks. And his master allows him to be part of the Framingham Minute Company. Now, I looked and I searched and I looked and I searched, and I can't find any record of when Peter Salem was freed. Can't find a manumission document, can't find any, found a couple of other people's, you know, which was great, and that was very important, but I never found any documentation or any journal records or anything that said when he was free. This is what we think happened. To free a slave in colonial times, you have to put up a bond. It cost you, the master, money to put, to free someone. So there's no real incentive to free anybody. Now, this wasn't done out of being evil or anything like that. This is simply done because this is good old Yankee practicality. If you are a slave owner, you have been responsible, financially responsible for the well-being of that person, more than likely since their birth. So you have fed, clothed, and housed that person. And now you're going to just let him free into our town. So what are they going to do? Where are they going to live? How are they going to take care of themselves? Now this bond is supposedly, if that person cannot take care of themselves, then that bond is issued there to take care of them. I've never found a record of that bond ever being issued out to a slave, or a slave even petitioning for that bond. Uh, now a lot of slaves paid their own bond and paid their, their way off. 
that's another way that um, John Jack and Concord did that, basically. Now, with Peter, here's the opportunity again. By joining the Minute Company, if you sent a slave into the military, the bond was exempt. You, the master, don't have to pay the bond. You, the slave, don't have to worry about owing your master a whole lot of money as a free man for putting up your bond. So it's a win-win situation here. Buckminster can free Peter by, by allowing him to join the Minute Company and get a de facto manumission. And that's what we believe happened. That is, that there's no record, there's no document, there was no big ceremony. He simply, when he became a member and was accepted in the Framingham Minute Company, essentially, he was free. Now, that doesn't mean outside of Framingham, he was accepted as being a free man. That means in Framingham, he might have been accepted that way. And he might clearly, probably, and more than likely, probably still lived wherever he lived when he was a slave. Probably his life did not change at all in that minute. April 19th, things start to become different for, for Peter. When the call goes out, Peter's company travels from Framingham. They miss the bridge. They don't get there. I can't tell you a wonderful story that Peter was there on the bridge. He wasn't. Framingham and a company gets to Miriam's Corner at or around 11.30, 11.45 um, that morning. So they've actually, really actually missed the battle of Miriam's Corner, the skirmish at Miriam's Corner. But that's where they enter. With them are Sudbury and Woburn companies. And they're traveling up through toward Bloody Angle. Now when they get to the Bloody Angle, that's where they all start to communicate. And that great tactic is figured out that, hey, you know what? They're going to march right through here. And we can stand on either side of the road. And I'm not going to give you a big, huge battle lesson about what happens at Bloody Angle, but if you haven't been there, it's right down the road. I do encourage that you go over there and visit, and you'll probably see me at the park. <laughs> so, <laughs> to put in my one page for the park there, too. Uh, so, Peter, that would have been Peter's first engagement at, Bloody, at the Bloody Angle. Uh, it would have been where he first um, saw battle, first saw any kind of bloodshed. Eight men were killed at Bloody Angle. Um, and they were all British soldiers. But let's stop and think about, this is kind of an interesting situation to be in. Here's a man who's been in servitude his whole life. He's had to bow his head. He's had to step off out of the way of any white man or any of his betters who passed him on the road. He has been basically relegated to how we treat a small child. For his, for his 25 years, we believe he was about 25 years old at that time. And now he's in a position where he has a gun, and he's told to go off and kill white men. Just think about that concept for, for is that really freedom, or is that something else? That's, a, that's an entirely different kind of concept that he has lived upon his whole life, to have to really go into that kind of a situation, which evidently he does very well. By the time we see Peter two months later at Bunker Hill, people are calling him a sharpshooter. Where he learned to fire a gun, I don't know. I'm not, I can't tell you. I've tried and tried and tried. Found out what kind of gun he had. It's a Charlottesville, very much like my Charlottesville over there. It's actually down in Washington at the Smithsonian Institution. It used to be at Bunker Hill. Peter Salem's actual Charlottesville used to be in the little museum that's near the Bunker Hill Monument. They took it down for authentication to, the, to Washington, D.C., and the Smithsonian never gave it back. <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened. <laughs> uh, so it's not on display down there, but I've talked with the curators down there. It is a Charlottesville. Um, it's one of the older models, not the models that were issued on or around um, 1776, 1777. Where he got it, I don't know. It's a very older model. It may have even been used in the French and Asian Wars. Or he may have found it. But let's face it, he was a minute man. He had to come up with a gun somewhere. Whoever had it either probably gave it to him. I doubt anybody even probably sold it to him because it would have been fairly old then. They, if they gave it to him or let him use it, that was the gun he had when he became a minute man. 
And evidently, he got really good at it. Now, we all know that muskets are inaccurate weapons. <laughs> muskets cannot fire straight. How is Peter Salem a sharpshooter? He's carrying a Charlottesville musket, and he becomes a sharpshooter. Took me a long time to figure this one out. And I did it finally. I didn't figure it out. I actually called somebody. <laughs> and I called some gunsmiths and people who collect old and vintage firearms. They talked to me about making a patch. Well, at that point, I'd never actually heard about making a patch before. What do you mean making a patch? Well, you patch the ball. You wrap the ball in linen. You grease down the barrel. And that takes the spin off of it. OK, that's a good concept. How long does that take? Well, the guy said, I know how to make a patch. I don't know exactly how long it would take. Well, now at the park, since I'm a park ranger, I have the wonderful privilege to get to fire muskets out at the park. And every now and then, if I'm really, really good, they'll let me take one and go out to an actual firing range. So I experimented with this stuff. It takes me about eight minutes to do that. <laughs> OK. Um, now, I can load and fire and dem for demonstrations. I'm really good on a standard fire. I can do it at about 20 seconds. That's what we think a grenadier did. That's what we think a Minuteman did, about 20 seconds, about three times a minute. Those who tell you five or six times a minute are just being braggadocious. <laughs> now, eight minutes is a really long time, and I don't believe it took him that long. He probably knew a way much better than I did, because I don't actually really ever fire a musket ball. You know, I do this for demonstration, so I'm never, I'm firing blanks all the time. It's really difficult for a middle-aged man to stand in front of a group of people and say that, but... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so, we think that it probably took him two to three minutes to load his weapon and fire in combat. Now, he's listed as a sharpshooter. So now we, we've taken an advance from that day, just two months ago, a bloody ankle. So somewhere along the line, either Peter and Buckminster went hunting or something, he found to himself to be very, very good in the long run. Now we're at Bunker Hill. At Bunker Hill, he's listed as a sharpshooter. So he has followed everyone down to Cambridge. He has participated in the Siege of Boston for two months. He has not returned to Framingham. And he was a member of Captain Simon Edgell's company. Thomas Drury in his company decides that, you know what? I, I, I don't want to be a lieutenant anymore. I got some money. I want to form my own company. Peter Salem is the third person to join Drury's company. And they all go off to Breed's Hill and fight the Battle of Bunker Hill. I always find that amusing. But um, <laughs> now, on Bunker Hill, this is the big controversy. The biggest controversy I found when I started studying Peter Salem, I never knew how many historians I would actually get to meet. How many people who would come up and say, absolutely not, he didn't do this. And what we're talking about is the theory or that Peter Salem killed Major John Pitcairn at Bunker Hill. Now, I see some people who have come to my program before out in the audience, and those will tell you that I'm honest. I'll tell you when I don't know something, I'll tell you if I haven't found it yet, and I'll tell you what I believe happened. Now, from the last time that some of you may have seen this program, I didn't know one way or the other, and I was actually saying that I didn't think he probably did it. There's a lot of new information with the help of the Daughters of the American Revolution, actually. <laughs> the Daughters of the American Revolution. Anybody in here remember the Daughters of the American Revolution? Okay, I'm not going to see anything bad about Daughters of the American The DAR in Framingham found out what I was doing. On November 12th in the year 2000, they had a day for Peter Sale. They have restored his gravesite. They actually know where his gravesite is. There is a monument there. And they found out that there was a crazy guy <laughs> over in Lexington that was portraying Peter Salem. And they wanted me to come out for that. And I came out and they had this great and wonderful day. And they have built this wonderful tombstone to him. It has his, you know, April 19th. It has Bunker Hill and it's Saratoga on it. It is in it. Probably when he was buried there, that was the colored section of the cemetery. And they put him over in the back of the dark. But what's really neat is today, he has his own big giant private lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it's been newly mowed and newly manicured and there's been some money and an endowment there to take care of it so he's got that perpetual care thing going on now which is which is really nice it's a very nice spot if you are in the old in Framingham go to the old burial ground in Framingham there's a nice brass plaque that's been placed out there on the street to let people know that he's there and there's also a great monument to him also there well in doing this they gave me a lot of information that they had they gave me a lot of very, very copies of very, very old books and papers. Things that were written in the same time period that Peter Salem, in the early 1800s. Peter Salem was still alive. And it, there's two whole pages in the Framingham history book about him. There's two whole pages in the Leicester history books about him. And it talks about the one thing that I've been looking for. Now, I knew this man was called a sharpshooter. There are a lot of stories, the common misbelief. If you read Who's Who in the American Revolution, it says Peter Salem killed John Pitcairn at Bunker Hill. A lot of people, a lot of historians say, nope, could have never happened. Didn't happen, couldn't happen. All right, here's what I know, and I'm going to let you all be the judge of, of what you think. There are 47 African Americans that fight on Bunker Hill on the colonial side in various different regiments. Peter Salem is Drury's regiment, and Edgell's company are 250 yards away from the readout on Bunker Hill. Readout at the top of the, the hill. Musket can't fire 250 yards. <laughs> Not on its best day. And even so, it wouldn't be accurate. <laughs> so, that gave me 150 yards of him out of place. What I was looking for is something that said, then we ordered the sharpshooters up to the readout. The DAR presented me with that information, that there is at least two accounts, not enough to give me a clear, you know, absolutely this happened, but there's at least two accounts that all of the regiments were asked to send their sharpshooters up to the readout. Okay, did Peter Salem still do this? now? You read a lot of different accounts of the day, and there are a lot of people who actually claim to have killed Pitcairn. There's a guy from Maine who claims to have killed Pitcairn. There's another guy from Groton who claims to have killed Pitcairn. Now, these are white men, and they really sat down and wrote out their accounts of what happened that day, and I don't believe them for one second, not because I want Peter Salem to do it, but let's think about what life was like at Bunker Hill. You're up on the top of the hill, Everybody's firing a musket, so it sounds like thunder. Everybody below you, there are horses coming up, there's a lot of soldiers coming up, you're afraid, and you probably have a field of vision of about six feet yeah. that you can actually comprehend what's going on around you. When you read these accounts of the men from the man from Maine and the man from Groton, they tell you the entire story of Bunker Hill as if, you know, it was in Technicolor and, you know, it was like the Patriot when you read this, you know. And they can tell clearly, yes, and I did this and I did that. Other accounts talk of a black man who puts a ball through Pitt Karen's neck. Peter Salem, there's an account that this is the one that really gets me. There's an account written that says, Peter Salem of Groton puts a ball through Pitt Karen's neck. I believe that the guy from Maine was there. I believe that the guy uh, from Groton was there. I believe that probably all of those people, those three people, probably were firing at Pitt Karen. Pitt Karen had a lot of bullets in him, remember? <laughs> if you remember the story, he had a lot of bullets in him. Peter Salem could easily have been one of them. He was a sharpshooter. There are, I've got 22 accounts that say a black man was firing and shot and killed to Karen. 22 accounts. You guys stop to think of it. Out of the 47 people of color on Bunker Hill, how many do you think were sharpshooters? <laughs> One. <laughs> you know? um, so let's do our little thumb thing here again. So I don't have to be put in a position. If you think Peter Salem could possibly have killed Major John Pitcairn, give the thumbs up. If you still don't know or are unsure, thumbs sideways. And if you think, no, he didn't, thumbs down. <laughs> there you go. That's my, my way of Benjamin Qualls, who wrote the um, Negro and the American Revolution, uh, says that the situation of Pitcairn 
and Peter Salem must be handled delicately. <laughs> Remember, he was a man writing about this in 1954. So, so that's my way of handling it delicately. You guys can make the decision on your own. So that's Peter Salem's exploits at Bunker Hill. Um, we know that he retained his position as a sniper. There are several accounts of him selling all sorts of things that an African American in that time period just wouldn't have. Swords, brochets from the, the, the rank symbols around that you wore on the neck. Uh, I'm not sure. I think I'm, that might not be the right term for that. Gorget. Thank Gorget. you. Gorget. I always get that. But he's, he's selling these things, and people are actually chuckling. Why aren't you keeping those things? They're, those are your those are your trophies. Yeah. It's like, look, man, I don't have a place to live anymore. <laughs> you know? This war's going to end one day. I got to go back to Framingham. Peter Salem goes on from there. He fights in Saratoga. And I start to think, and I, I, I know we're kind of running short on time, so I'm not going to take you through the rest of the war. But so basically what happens is Salem fights at Saratoga. And there's a big mystery because for the long, longest time, people were saying he only did a three-year hitch. And after Saratoga, he went back home. Just found out that that's not true. Just found out that he actually served to the end of the war. He re-enlisted. He was only out of the war for approximately three months. Mm. Went back and re-enlisted. Now, in, in his re-enlistment, because of all of that, because he was fighting on April 19th, he would have received a bounty coat. Um, that's the only award that we know. Now, the bounty coats were given for those men who started in the war after their first year of service. So he would have received two things his definite freedom everywhere for serving one year in the military, and a wool coat. And if you can see the way I'm dressed is what we believe he dressed in this kind of manner. I'm wearing all linen, great in summertime, not so great on a night like tonight. I'm telling you, the walk to the car was really, really difficult. <laughs> Let alone having to just imagine living in these kind of, this kind of clothing in, in, in the wintertime. Linen, my fiance, I'm lucky enough that my fiance is a costume designer. She knows everything about cloth and, and the history of how things are made. And one of the things she said is, did you realize that linen was called slave cloth in that time period? It's the cheapest material around, you know? Slave cloth, that's, that's what slaves wear. Linen and leather, cheapest material around. Really hard if you're gonna make a colonial outfit today. <laughs> but the cheapest stuff around. So we think that, yes, he would have had leather gaiters on. Um, if, he had, if he wore gaiters, we probably would have worn gaiters. They keep you a little bit drier and a little bit warmer. We know most of the soldiers wore that. But everything else I'm wearing is linen. And this isn't the old kind of, you know, I mean, this is the, yeah, right, this is linen. Um, the wind whips through this stuff. <laughs> this guy was cold and uncomfortable. So I told this to an eighth grade class earlier today, and they said, that's it? He fought for a whole year in a war and they gave him a coat? So what? <laughs> you go through walking around wearing this stuff, a wool coat is going to be godsend to you. And, and that was the first thing, a bounty coat. We also know that coats were fairly expensive, and even the short working man jackets, like, and that's what a bounty coat basically looks like. Imagine this in brown wool, and that's the big mistake where you see paintings and everything, and they show the entire Continental Army in these brown wool coats when we know that they would have been blue or white in some, in some cases. <laughs> that's why those painters from that time period did that, because those guys that they met were all coming back from the war wear, proudly wearing their bounty coats because it really truly was an award that they were given, you know. To give somebody a coat in that time period was a big deal. So Peter Salem, that is the only military award that we know he was, he was given. He did fight until the complete end of the war. Most of that time he was serving in Cambridge. Um, he uh, was sent back down to Cambridge and basically worked as a guard. Now, one thing about his service, he was a sniper. Here is a guy who had been a slave, who is now put in charge of killing rich white men. That's what a sniper does. He shoots officers, right? That's how we won this war. So that's a very difficult thing. But the entire time that he's doing this, he is also acting as the valet to his colonel. Ah. So he is Edgel's valet through the entire war. This is not something that every other private in the war had to do. 
So even though we had a fully integrated army, our very first army was fully integrated, it was still not an equal army. Because at least in the case, and I've seen several other African American soldiers that did serve some form of a valet duty or some form of a cook or some, some sort of domestic capacity as they fought through the war. So after the war, what happens to Peter? Peter goes back to Framingham. Does what all the other soldiers do. Talks about the war. Drinks, impresses women. Finally does meet a woman, Katie Benson. Marries her. A long time I could not figure out whether this man was married or not. This union produced no children. I could not find anything. A constable record, a church record of their marriage. I was, you know, I found out in Leicester. She was from Leicester, Massachusetts. So Peter left his home and moved to Leicester. Now that's love. I've been to Leicester. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> to, uh, to move out there, where he lived out there, and he didn't even live in downtown Leicester. He didn't live in center of Leicester. <laughs> he lived like on the outskirts of Leicester. And he lived in a cabin, and if you do travel out to Leicester one day, go there. He lived on what is now called Peter Salem Road. They named the road after him. Peter Salem Road intersects with Pitcairn Avenue, and I'm not lying. <laughs> I, I did not make that up. He lives in Leicester, and we know he's living in Leicester until at least 1809. And we also know that his marriage does not work out. And because Katie Benson seems to leave him after about five years. There's no written record of it. And Usually, if there was some sort of problem with the union, you would see things in like the town constable report, or you would hear things. Peter Salem was well liked in this town. People really did like him. Uh, he seemed to, his, his trade was caning. Cane chairs, fixed the seats of chairs, made baskets, things like that. Even in colonial times, you couldn't make a living doing that. So it seems what happened is that people, he had a good personality. And people would have him come over because in that time you didn't just invite a black man over for dinner. He had come do something. And then he sat in the kitchen or he sat out back behind the kitchen and he told stories and then you all could go out and talk and listen to him. And that seems to be what he really did for a living. He talked about the war. He talked about what life was like. This guy was a real life Forrest Gump. <laughs> Think about it. This guy was around all of the major events of the day. It's not mine. That's <laughs> time to go home. Well, I guess it's time to go home, right? <laughs> but this guy was around some, <laughs> some of the biggest events in the time period. He was around some of the most famous people in the time period. And people were fascinated by that. He traveled farther than most people did in that time period. Most people never traveled more than 30 miles from their birthplace in colonial time. And here this guy's gone to New York, he's been down into Boston, he's gone down into the southern parts of Massachusetts, into Connecticut. He's gone all over the place and he's seen, he's seen General Washington. Oh my God, you know, that alone got him a few meals, I'm sure. <laughs> but this is kind of hard. When you're making, that's okay to do that when you're on your own. And you got a family, or you got a wife to take care of. You know, Katie was a slave until 1783. Well, nobody wanted to hear her story, so she wasn't getting invited over to dinner. So it was getting kind of hard. And that's what I believe happened, and I think it just got too hard for them to stay together. And she left him, which is kind of unheard of in that time period. But she did, she left him, and they really were married, and that's some new information that I found out that they really actually were married, and she did leave him, and there were no children produced. So there can't be anybody who says, oh, I'm Peter Salem's great, great, great. <laughs> so, but he's still in Leicester. He stays in Leicester. She leaves Leicester, <laughs> and he's stuck there. And he lived in a little cabin um, in Leicester, and he lived there we know at least until 1809. And the only thing that I have ever found that actually proves Peter Salem exists is this. And I'll pass it around. It's really hard to read. But basically, on the 
12th of December, it looks like, in 1809, Peter Salem borrowed $4.88, which he had to pay back interest on. And he did. And he um, paid back $5.56 in interest. This tells us, this one piece of paper tells us a lot of things, and I will pass it around. As you can see, as I'm passing around, Peter Salem could not read or write. He never learned to read or write. He made an X, and it was witnessed there. It was a common thing in that time period. We also know some other things. But even in 1809, he wasn't doing well. He had not parlayed his military service into uh, any sort of a business or an opportunity for himself. He was alone, and he was still having to borrow money. So, you know, he's getting up there for colonial times, definitely. And he's living alone. Eventually, it got so bad for Peter that he couldn't work anymore. You know, he had been a sharpshooter. He'd probably been wearing linen his whole life. So, you can imagine, probably had arthritis pretty badly. And it, uh, there are accounts that talk about him not being able to work with his hands anymore. And in Leicester, like good old Yankee colonial towns, basically kicked him out. And that wasn't because he was black, and it wasn't because they were being mean to him. That's what they did to anybody who wasn't from their town in that time period. Yeah. You couldn't take care of yourself. You had to go back to your family. You had to go back to your own. People who had a responsibility for you. He wasn't from Leicester. You know, I'm not from New England. And I'll never be from New England. <laughs> because I've been told that. My family's not from here. I don't have any relatives here. I'm not from New England. My family's from Virginia originally. And that's what I really am. I'm a Virginia. I can go claim a lot of rights down in Virginia, make a lot of noise down there. But I keep very quiet up here because I'm not from New England. <laughs> so, but that was the concept back then. And in many ways, in certain areas of New England, you still see that. <laughs> so, he was basically, he was packed up and he was sent back to Framingham. Now, who does he have in Framingham? Well, he's got the Belknaps, yeah. and he's got the Buckminsters, and they were, they were yeah, still like around. <laughs> Ironically, his two former masters get together, get a bunch of people in the town to put up money, and they put up enough money in trust for Peter Put him in a cabin just on the outs, not even on the outskirts of town. You go to the old, old center of Framingham, and there's a little church, and that's where the Framingham Historical Society is. If you travel just down the road about a mile, not even quite a mile, just under a mile, there's an apartment complex there now, and a little pond. It's the northwest pond of the city. Peter Salem lived on that pond. His cabin was on that pond. That's where he lived. That was a fairly short, you know, less than a mile from the center of town. He lived his remaining days there. Uh, people came to see him. Um, he was treated fairly well. And only in the last couple of weeks of his life, when he got so bad that they needed somebody there all the time, they did move him to the poorhouse of Framingham. But he only seemed to live there for, I, I think it's under two weeks that he actually lived there. I've been to this spot. I've sat there. I've ignored the big apartment building. It's not a bad spot. I mean, a lot of people would hope to retire on a big, nice pond and look out over that every day. Uh, so it wasn't a horrible, tragic ending. Yes, he didn't have any children. He didn't have a family honor him. And it was 225 years before anybody really remembered him. But still, the man had an incredible military service. And I can't find anything bad about him. He wasn't a drunkard. He wasn't a womanizer. He paid his debts. <laughs> You can't, and he was a military hero. But for 225 years, most of us never even heard of him. We've never heard of this man. And everybody's heard of Crispus Attucks, right? All he did was stand up and die. <laughs> they did a little more than that. But, um, but really, you know, in comparison to eight years of military service, um, really being an honorable person his whole life, you know, not finding anybody, and having people who used to actually own him as property then feel that they need to morally take care of him for the rest of their life means that he was a very, very special man. And I do thank you all for putting up with me tonight. <laughs>